Our talk this evening is given by Asa Mittman of Chico State University, who we originally met as a graduate student here at Stanford, and occasionally he points me to books on this subject, and when I check them out of the library, there are little notes in them on pieces of paper that he had written down when he was using the book. Oh, thought, that's a riot. I didn't know that. That's hysterical. Well, at least I didn't write in the books. You didn't write in the book. There were little scraps of paper. He sent me to one to try and figure out the iconography of medieval monkeys looking in mirrors. And he sent me to the exact book. And when I opened it up, there was this little slip of paper, which I thought was just precious. Um, so this evening, as you already know, he's talking about medieval bassuaries and the symbolisms of the creatures that are found in these seemingly charming picture books of animals and imaginary human-like figures. Uh, in the chat, I'll try and put up my favorite um, website for these creatures, which is something I also use a lot for trying to tr figure out one dragon from another or one griffin from the other. Um, many of you will remember Ace's wonderful talk, as well as an article he did for our newsletter <clears throat> back in 2016 and 2018, talking about a, a uh, show, an exhibit he curated for the Morgan on these beautiful books, and included many photographs of the treasures that he got to see while he was working in their holdings. If you would like to see some of those photographs again, these jeweled books and what have you, you can find them by going to our website and looking at the spring 2016 issue of our newsletter. So now let us welcome Asa, who has his first slide up already. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I, uh, I'll actually be showing um, several images from a bestiary that was in that show at the Morgan. Um, so you will have a, a chance to recall it um, when it comes by. So uh, thank you all for having me. Uh, it's always great to talk with you all. Um, it's been a couple of years, but yeah, I've been giving talks to the CERM seminar for about 20 years now, which seems impossible. So here's my plan. I have a fairly informal um, talk. I've got a little a little chunk of prepared text at the very beginning, a little chunk at the very end, and then the rest um, is going to be me working my way through some images and their peculiarities. So, bestiaries. Um, bestiaries are among the most entertaining of all medieval texts. Seem to be little more than fun dictionaries of wild animals, but a closer read finds them to be jam-packed with the ideologies of their creators and consumers. The prejudices they encode are not the focus of the texts or the images, but are slipped in around the edges, conjoined to seemingly harmless tales of hedgehogs and hyenas, satyrs and sirens. Presentations of bestiaries to modern audiences that do not draw attention to the biases embedded in these manuscripts run the risk of perpetuating them. So in this talk, I will consider both the delights and the dangers of bestiary manuscripts. I'll start with the delights to entertain and amuse you, uh, and then I will slowly, hopefully, reel you in for the grimmer material that will increase toward the end. So, to start. To start, there we go. What is a bestiary? So bestiaries are literally books of beasts. The term comes from the Latin bestiarium, which ultimately derives from bestia, which means beasts, wild animals. But to get to bestiarium first, it went through bestiarios, which in classical Latin from ancient Rome meant one who fights with wild beasts in the public spectacles, a beast fighter. Uh, in medieval Latin, though, this eventually becomes, as uh, J.F. Niermeyer puts it in his Dictionary of Medieval Latin, a zoological handbook. So, that's what they are, sort of. Now, bestiaries are surprisingly common today. Every bookshop you walk into sells several of them, mostly aimed at children who, of course, do love reading about animals, mythological and real, especially if they come with nice pictures. But there are also bestiaries that are aimed at adults. Um, so just as a handful of examples, the Atlas of Monsters came out a couple of years ago and shows us mythical creatures 
from around the world. And if we zoom in here, you can see, for example, the manticore and this fellow down here. Do note that both of these figures are presented in full profile with uh, long beards evident. We will see these images returning in various ways. So that's one ambit kids. On the other hand, I have this very elegant uh, bestiary with illustrations by Alexander Calder, who you will all know from his very famous um, sculptures, mostly uh, mobiles uh, and other such. Um, and this one uh, is paired, his lovely uh, sort of light line drugs. They look to me like um, very elegant New Yorker cart cartoons. Um, this is paired with various bestiary texts from various um, places. So uh, in this case, for example, we have the whale. Um, and uh, it's kind of slightly goofy modern translation um, that is adapted from the Middle English um, which you can see here, this is the original, um, on the nature of sete grandie, that is to say, big cetaceans on the nature of, like, big whales. Um, and uh, this is a, 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 an image that gets reproduced in lots of best series, as well as in other related texts, like the voyage of St. Brendan, who was an Irish monk who purportedly traveled um, west, uh, westward from Ireland and saw all kinds of fabulous things, actually sailed to hell, which apparently is partway across the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and um, so of the whale, for example, uh, we read that um, they spend most of their time, you know, at the bottom of the sea, but every so often they come and sprawl out on the surface. Um, they eat, you know, giant quantities of fish through their enormous mouths. But the real um, risk they present is that when they come up to the surface, they look like an island. So big are they, and so still. And so sailors trapped in storms, seeing an island will moor their ship fast to them and come out and stand upon them. And as you see, um, both in uh, Calder's image and in this um, medieval image, they will light a fire upon the whale's back to warm themselves and cook their food. But that, of course, will alarm the whale, who will then dive and pull the people down to the depths with him. Now, in the St. Brendan narrative, the saint knows all about this. He doesn't tell his friend these other monks he's traveling with, so he lets them think they're all going to die, but they're all fine. And every year from that point forward, Brendan goes back out to the same spot where um, on Easter, the whale returns and brings with it each time their favorite brass cooking pot, which is now forever on its back. Um, but the other thing that I want to draw attention to um, in this text is that that's, you know, more or less the story that's set up here, minus the Brendan editions. But beneath that is this thing that's labeled signification. Um, oh, I thought I might have a detail, I forgot. Okay. So the signification, it's usually actually called a moralization in a medieval context, is something that accompanies many bestiaries and many of the images in them, not consistently, and they're not all the same. You could have several moralizations of any animal in one bestiary and different ones across all the bestiaries. But what they are, are specifically Christian readings of these stories. So what does the whale tell us about God's plan for humanity, for example? So uh, in this case, um, the, the, we read that the whale, uh, that um, we read the significance of that is that the devil is great in will with monstrous force and skill. These powers he imparts to witches in their arts. He gives men hunger and thirst and many another lust, drawing them by his breath to follow which is death. Who hears the devil's word will rue the day they heard who ties his hopes there too, will plunge with him below. Hello. The rhyme scheme in this translation is not brilliant. But, um, so you have a story about a whale that is a dangerous thing that can pull you down to the depths. And so this becomes a symbol of Satan to whom you could foolishly moor yourself and then be pulled down to hell. And so these are um, very common accompaniment to these. Okay, so we've got the children's version that I showed. We've got this one that's intended for adult readers. They're popular all over the world. These are um, 
a pair of 1950s Argentinian bestiaries, um, one by Julio Cortazar and the other by the very famous Jorge Luis Borges, um, uh, which uh, became published in English as a manual of fantastic animals. It's quite entertaining, as all things by Borges are. Um, there is, of course, you can always predict these things. As it turns out, a French film titled Bestiaire, uh, from 2012, directed by Dennis Cope, which is described as follows. Along the rhythm of the seasons, beasts and humans regard each other. Bestiary unfolds like a picture book about mutual observation, a contemplation of a stable imbalance, and of loose, tranquil, and indefinable elements. Very French filmy. Um, I do wonder whether the pun of stable works in French too. Um, but note that the bestiary unfolds like a picture book, a nod to the fact that bestiaries were, of course, actually picture books. Now, if you go to Amazon and search bestiary, you get a rather broad array of oddities. Um, so, you know, of course, you get the expected fantasy novels. You also get fantasy novels, um, as well as serious uh, literary fiction and academic books, and literary nonfiction, and neo-pagan guidebooks, and of course, Dungeons and Dragons bestiaries, this um, from the Pathfinder Kingmaker subset of. Um, and it is probably by Dungeons and Dragons that bestiaries have lived on the most actively into the modern world, um, this is the original copy of the Monster Manual, which is their version of a bestiary, uh, published in 1977 and, you know, used by a bajillion people throughout the whole world ever since. And in fact, uh, D&D had a real kind of blossoming renaissance during um, the pandemic because it was an activity you could do outside, spaced away from people or over Zoom, where everybody could be participating in, you know, the same general activity. Um, now, the drawings here left a bit to be desired, perhaps, but you can see here the manticore, one of the beasts from within it, and this is a um, a creature that comes from ancient Greek mythology, uh, passed on into Roman mythology, um, and appearing in many bestiaries. I'll show you some medieval images in a moment. The structure of these are, of course, a little bit different because D&D expects you to fight with and probably kill these creatures, so we learn um, how much armor they have, and what their special attacks are, like their tail spikes, and so on. Um, but we also get little um, texts about them that tell us a bit about their sort of life and habits, which are not unlike the ones that accompany other, um, the, the other kinds of bestiaries um, that we could look at, like uh, the medieval ones. So, for example, we read here that manticores prefer dismal lairs, so they're typically found in caves or underground. The game is called Dungeons and Dragons. There's a lot of dungeons in it. Um, they range in all climes, although they enjoy warm places more than cold. And their favorite prey of manticores is man, and they are usually encountered outside their lairs, hunting for human victims. Okay, sure. Do take a little bit of note, though, of this particular human head. It is a, a large, heavy head with a big emphasized brow, hefty nose, long hair, and most notably, a very grand, long, and forked beard. Now, this may recall, for some of you, particular images, uh, such as um, those of Moses, here seen in the famous Well of Moses in Dijon by Klaus Fluter, a late medieval kind of virtuosic sculptor. File that away. Um, this is the updated uh, version of the Monster Manual. You can see how much is changed in the style, but how much is retained in the form. Um, and this takes us back to the Manticore here, which again is presented in relatively similar, if much more schematic fashion. These things are so popular that even I am now supposed to be, in theory, writing one of these. Um, which I swear I'm going to get to one of these days, um, which uh, will, in theory, be illustrated by the wonderful artist whose work you see here, uh, Iman Joy El Shami, who is an Italian 
um, artist who specializes in drawing um, and contains a, a, an array of um, less well-known but equally wondrous uh, beasts from throughout the world. I think my favorite that we've come up with so far is the Squonk, which is a Pennsylvania myth about a very, very sad creature who nobody loves because he is so hideous. Um, I, I love this one. I hope you all will too. Um, so, back now, though, to the medieval. Um, now, many of you have probably... I, I, I'm going to take it back to them. Oh, so somebody put was... it in their bag. Oh. There we go. Um, many of you have probably heard me talk about uh, medieval maps many times. So I'm going to do this really fast. I just want to point out basically two or three features. So this is a pretty typical uh, medieval map. It is the Psalter map. It is beautiful. It is tiny. It was royal, um, and it was for a religious book. Uh, we can see that it has, of course, uh, Christ up at the very top being sent by angels, rising out of the world, blessing humanity, uh, and holding uh, another image of the world in the schematic TO map format in his hand. Beneath him is the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve on either side of the tree. At the very center of the world is Jerusalem um, in a series of concentric circles. And to me, of course, most wonderfully are the series of wonders or marvels, strange peoples off in the edge here. Um, as well as other notable features at the edge of the world, like the wall containing the apocalyptic people of Gog and Magog off um, in the northeast, and Britain down in the lower uh, corner there, the place where the map was made, also a place um, riddled with monsters. Now, the vital point I want to make about uh, medieval thought well, about medieval Christian understanding of the world and its creatures, marvelous and mundane, comes from Augustine of Hippo, who was the main architect of Christianity as a formal religion. And he was a, an African man born in what is now Algeria in the fourth century. Uh, he lived at the city of Hippo. Um, and he says, the circle of the earth is our great book. In it, I read the perfection, which is promised in the book of God. What he's saying here is that we can look to the circle of the earth as captured on this map, right? We can look to the world itself and read the world the way that people read the Bible. These are equivalent texts. Both, they believed, were provided by God and both serve the same function, which was to teach humanity the most important things it needs to know. Now, this brings us back to those moralizations. That's why they're there, because animals and monsters and marvels only existed, they would have said, because they teach us things. Now, bestiaries are um, a popular genre, not only in Europe, but also very popular in the Islamic world and even also um, in East and South Asia, where they appear in slightly different formats, but often with images and texts that have traveled back and forth some. Um, and they are really popular, particularly in the 12th through the 14th century. They come um, the, from the oldest text that we have that really is an inspiration for these, is a second century early Christian text written in Greek called the Physiologus, which means the naturalist. Um, and already from that first one, it tells fun tales about animals and provides these Christian moralizations. This is added to with texts by Pliny the Elder, the first century Roman scientist who died in the eruption of Mount Vesuvius, um, and Isidore of Seville, the seventh century uh, Spanish bishop, and other important um, Christian authors. The one that we're seeing now is known as the Worksop Bestiary, is one, one that was in um, my show at the Morgan, uh, and it is an absolutely magnificent book. Um, it was made in England, maybe in Lincoln or York, sorry everybody, not Salisbury, um, further north, uh, and in the late 12th century. So on this image, we can see the way that it mixes the exotic and fantastic with the local and pedestrian. Up the top, we have a centaur, well known from you know, classical mythology, and beneath that we have a hedgehog, the you know, most uh, harmless of English 
uh, animals. So the hedgehog text is pretty simple and not moralized at all. Um, we read, uh, that Physiologus says that, that you can see that right here, Physiologus dikit. Uh, so that's, um, the Physiologus says that a hedgehog has the shape of a suckling piglet. On the outside, it is entirely covered with spines. During the grape gathering season, the hedgehog enters the vineyard, and when it sees a good grape, it climbs up the vine and removes that grape in such a way as to make all the clusters fall onto the ground. Then it climbs down and rolls itself over them so that uh, all the grapes get caught in its spines. This is how it brings food to its offspring. Adorable. And uh, here is that rather um, hefty hedgehog with all of these uh, grapes stuck in its many quilts. Wonderful. Um, if we want, though, to get at uh, one with a good moralization, we can look at the lion. Now, this should not be uh, surprising that the lion gets uh, a lot of attention. It is often the first uh, creature in the book, as uh, we see in the works out bestiary. This great bee here, note, has an image of Christ, hand raised in blessing, holding the cross staff in front of him in the bee that forms bestiarum, bestiary. So this is saying, this is a bestiary. And then we get to De Natoris Leonum, on the nature of the lion. Now, there is a lot on the nature of the lion, but the image really focuses on what the text refers to as his third nature. When the lioness gives birth to her cubs, she brings them forth dead and watches over them for three days until their sire, arriving on the third day, breathes in their faces and gives them life. Thus, now we shift from text about the animal's supposed natural uh, behaviors to the moralization. Thus, the omnipotent father, our Lord Jesus Christ, on the third day arose from the dead. As Jacob said, he will sleep like the lion, and thus the lion's wealth will be raised up. So, again, this is a belief about what lions did, how they reproduced, what their cubs were like, but then immediately turned to the end of uh, reconfirming a Christian reader's understanding of the goal of the universe, really. Okay. Similarly, we could look at the unicorn, which in the best years is most often shown being hunted as you can see it here. So two hunters attack, one with a spear, one with an ax, um, and they are uh, practicing the uh, very usual scene here. Many of you have probably seen the unicorn tapestries uh, in New York, the cloisters have this same scene on them. Um, the myth that the only way to capture a unicorn is for a virgin girl to be led to where it lives, and left there in the woods, and the unicorn then leaps into her lap and embraces her, and while it is so distracted, um, then the hunters come and kill it. Thus, our Lord Jesus Christ is spiritually the unicorn, about which it is said, and as the beloved sons of unicorns. From the Psalms, my horn shall be exalted like that of the unicorn. Also the Psalms, Zacharias, I shall raise up a horn of salvation to us in the house of David, his servant. Okay, again, something believed to be um, the actual behaviors of an actual creature used. The earth is our great book, Augustine's method of interpreting the world applied here to what the Christian message is of these creatures. Um, now, back to the manticore. Remember the manticore? That's the image that we saw from the uh, Dungeons and Dragons monster manual and also was in that very first children's bestiary, modern bestiary that I showed. Now the manticore is interesting to me for a number of reasons. Um, there is the figure, you can see it's a, a sort of lion that has a rather human head. The head is wearing this funny little curved hat, looks like a Smurf hat, I will explain. Um, has a long and somewhat wild beard that is a predominantly kind of reddish figure, has a large um, hooked, bent, wrinkled nose, and mouth full of apparently alarming teeth. Um, now the manticore doesn't have a moralization with it. Uh, we just read that in India is born a beast called the manticore, 
quote, this is a quote from Salinas, another one of these early authors who's often used in the best series, quote, it has a triple array of teeth, which is why those teeth in its mouth are a little hard to understand, meeting in alternate positions, the face of a man, green eyes, a russet color, that red is a constant, um, the body of a lion, the, a pointed tail like the skin, uh, stinger of a scorpion, a voice like a whistle, so that it imitates the tone of reed pipes. It very zealously seeks human flesh. Its feet are so strong, its leaps so powerful that neither the broadest space nor the widest barrier can hinder it. Nor the widest barrier can hinder it. I hadn't noticed that. Oh, wow. Okay, I got to add another chapter to my next book. Anyway, another one of these, the London Bestiary, uh, gives us a very similar image again. Um, again, we get the uh, human head with the same general physiognomy, the same beard, very similar pointy little hat. Um, this is a manuscript I came across for the first time in a Getty exhibition. Maybe some of you saw it, the Book of Beasts show. It was rather spectacular, and it was focused entirely on bestiaries. It had lots of great bestiaries, and it had text about them. In this case, what we read about the manticore and the pandrus, that's this one, and the yale, that's this one down here. It tells us that after introducing the lion as the king of beasts, you've all just seen that, this bear steery continues with other land animals. Of the three legendary creatures on these pages, the yale at the bottom right has perhaps the most unusual ability. So then it focuses in on the yale, says nothing about the pandrus, uh, and also nothing about the manticore. I want to spend a little more time on that manticore, which looks quite a lot like the manticore we were just looking at. And here is another bestiary, this one at Oxford, maybe made in Salisbury, um, which again has the same basic features. Again, it has that russet color, including the reddish beard and hair. Again, it has the um, nose with the large noticeable bump in it and the large teeth. Again, it has that little curvy, odd hat. And this one you see is actually chomping a human leg in its fearsome teeth. Now, first, that cap. This is what's called a Phrygian cap. Um, and it shows up all over the place um, from the ancient period forward. Uh, this is the god Mithras, who is believed to have been in, an import into the Roman Empire um, in around the first century from what they would have referred to as the East, what they would called Asia, which we would think of as now the Near East or the Middle East, um, possibly Persia. Um, and you can see both the god Mithras and both of his followers are wearing these odd little Phrygian caps. Um, you can see he's actually slaying a bull that lives in the moon. It's a very complicated story. Uh, but you can also tell that he is in, depicted as an Eastern exotic figure, not only by his hat, but also because he is wearing trousers, something no, um, you, um, no uh, uh, Romans were wearing um, in the second century when this was made, a standard way of denoting Eastern exotic peoples. Um, now, we can see a couple of other uh, classical images. In this case, a quote-unquote barbarian, possibly a Dacian. Um, those are the peoples of Romania. Long, kind of scraggly beard. Again, that same cap. This one, another head with a Phrygian cap. This head and body actually don't go with each other. But the head um, a, uh, is, again, a um, quote-unquote barbarian figure, somebody from... Um, a place distant from and alien to the parts of Rome where these images are being consumed. Now, who else do we see wearing these hats? Well, the answer is Jews, as in this case in the Biblia Moralise, an image that shows Jews literally falling into the mouth of hell, which yawns open before them with sharp teeth and flames. And you can see some of the caps are just sort of peaked, but others, like these three in the front, have that same curved forward element. Now, the Biblia Moralise is literally a moralized Bible. That is to say, it works the same way that bestiaries do, except it uses the Bible instead of animals or the world itself. And so you get a little passage from the Bible and a literal illustration of it, and then a moralization of that, and a moralizing image of it as well. 
And so this image of the Jews is one of those moralizing images. This image of men with the beards, reddish hair, and the hats. Um, now, it's important to remember that to Christians in Europe in the Middle Ages, Jews were, in fact, an Asian group. If you note from the TO map, which lays out very clearly what continents or parts of the world are where, the section that contains Jerusalem and Bethlehem and Zion and Jericho and Jordan and so on is all here, which is to say here, which is to say it is in Western Asia. And so thinking of those hats, it is a reminder that that is part of the kind of orientalization of Jews by Christians in the Middle Ages. Okay, so these all hold together as a piece. And so we start getting an image of these wonderful, fantastic creatures that are also presented recognizably, identifiably, clearly as monsterized Jews. Okay, uh, Jews show up in other kinds of hats um, in other contexts, which also show up on other kinds of monsters like this human-headed wyvern. Um, and so this is a trope that we can see again and again and again. The show has nothing to say about the Manticore. We just move straight onto the Yale and we say nothing about this recognizably anti-Semitic image, nothing. Okay, um, well, what about the hyena? Now, the hyena is a fabulous creature, really strange in the Middle Ages. Um, they uh, live in, um, uh, in the tombs of the dead and eat these corpses. They are sometimes male and sometimes female, in meaning they actually um, transition from one gender to the other freely, and for that reason, it is an unclean animal. Note how long some ideologies endure. Um, it has various traits, including that it can imitate the human voice so that it can attack people um, by this ruse. Then we get to the moralization. The children of Israel, who from the beginning served the living God, are like this beast given later to riches and riotous living, they worship idols, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is the version of it that appears in uh, that same Getty show. In this delicately painted bestiary, the animals appear alongside depictions of the biblical narratives they signify, an unusual addition. Here, the image of the hyena devouring a corpse at right is complemented by a scene of the Israelites worshiping the golden calf on the opposite page, a story told in the book of Exodus. The text explains that the hyena associated with the depraved aspects of human nature, quote, denotes the children of Israel who forsook the true father and were so foolish that they worshiped idols. <clears throat> so, uh, Yes, Guillaume Leclerc's French version of the best year proved to be quite popular and it's retelling the moral lessons behind the behavior of the beast. No further commentary needed. Now, these are the images that we get. On the one hand, this hideous ravenous beast literally eating the flesh of the dead. And that is paired with, again, recognizable images caricaturing Jews through the same standard tropes that we just saw. Um, oh, so they've got the hats, they've got the beards, they've got the reddish hair, all of this again and again, plus, of course, Moses with his horns. Okay, one more image. This is my last image, but it was the first one in that Getty show. Now, Again, wonderful scene of the capture of the unicorn. And again, like the first one I showed you from the Works Out bestiary, this one in the Ashmole bestiary, which is very famous, probably the most famous of these and really glittery and, 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 and impressive in many ways, um, has again, the female virgin, again, the uh, unicorn in her lap, and again, Two hunters, one with an ax and one with a spear, the spear already going through the unicorn who kind of piteously looks up to her, though she has eyes not for it at all. Um, 
Okay, two figures. Now, by now, you're already ahead of me, I am sure. You recall the text, and thus the Lord Jesus Christ is spiritually the unicorn who shall raise up a horn of salvation to us in the house of David, his servant. So the unicorn is Jesus. Okay. If this is an allegory for Christ's death, then it probably is a good idea to attend to the figures killing him. Okay, this is actually from the um, exhibition catalog that came with it. Um, the wall text that came with it said nothing about this particularly at all, but um, it just tells us the story. Uh, the unicorn, uh, so it tells us the story of the unicorn's capture on the previous page, and then that's only half the story. It also symbolized the incarnation, the moment when Christ was conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary, rendering him human and vulnerable to death. In the luxurious image above, the beast rests on the left, the maiden seated before a tree, while a hunter on the right, two hunters, uh, but one stabs the animal in its side. The unicorn symbolizes Christ, and the maiden represents his mother, the virgin, while the killing of the creature serves as an allegory for Christ's death. Again, if this is an allegory for Christ's death, shouldn't we note who is killing him? Well, this is our same figure again. Again, the Phrygian cap. Again, the emphasized nose. Again, the reddish hair. Curiously not bearded. I don't know quite what to make of that. Um, it's worth a bit more research that I haven't figured out yet. But anyway, this is clearly the same um, uh, uh, tropes that we have seen in the manticore images, which are, again, human-eating monsters. Again, uh, in the moralized Bible, where we saw Jews falling into the mouth of hell, in the scene of the worship of the golden calf, which was paired with the hyena, a gender changing, corpse-eating, human voice imitating, lying monster. Okay. What about the other guy, though? The weird blue guy? So that color has a very specific meaning uh, in the later Middle Ages when these manuscripts were all made. Um, this is an image that shows us... Um, a, uh, a crusader and a so-called, quote-unquote, Saracen knight. Saracen is a medieval uh, Christian pejorative term used for uh, a kind of racialized idea of Islam, whereby uh, they are seen as dusky, dark-skinned, even like this blue, black and blue as a lid, one medieval English text refers to them as. This text is sometimes, or this image is sometimes said to be uh, Richard the Lionheart and Saladin, um, but that I think doesn't really hold up. It's just some random crusader with, you know, the, the, the uh, lions rampant upon his shield and some Muslim ruler. Uh, but in any case, that is what we can read out of that blueness is racialized Islam. Now, yeah, you did. There are more of these curious figures and they are given all of these subsidiary winds around the circle of the earth. The uh, cardinal winds, north, south, east, and west, those get these ruddy faces, but that blue-black color reserved for the subsidiary winds, some of which are said in text to be malign, though not all of them. Okay, so this is who our blue figure with the tightly curled hair, another trope for the so-called Saracen is. So what that gives us then is a unicorn, which is Christ, being killed by a Jew and a Muslim, who would also have been understood in the period as an Asian and an African. So here we have the Asian figure, the African figure, and the European figure, or the European figure. Note how closely matched they are. So, all right. The bestiary has everything from hedgehogs to hyenas, from delightful fables to deadly fictions. These allusions and symbols and references were not mere rhetorical exercises. The bestiary's period of popularity from the 12th through the 14th century coincides precisely with the era of the Crusades. These texts and images were part of the architecture of exclusion that led to Christian kings of Europe uh, murdering and expelling 
the entire local Jewish populations, first in England and then throughout the continent, and also supported and inspired the launching of disastrous foreign wars, the Crusades themselves, in the name of reclaiming the so-called Holy Land and in the process slaughtering Muslims, Jews, and even Christians alike. So, yet we should delight in these images insofar as they are delightful. But we should also acknowledge the bigotries they advertised, which are smuggled in amongst lively images and entertaining tales, like modern anti-Semitic and Islam Islamophobic content slipped in now amongst Facebook cat memes and Twitter posts and TikTok dance videos. They had great reach and wider acceptance, not despite, but because these mendacious motifs are nestled in amongst the sharp spines of the hedgehog, like so many poisoned apples. Thank you. Thank you, Asa. My pleasure. I, um, we have some time. I actually managed to keep to time. I first, as always, every talk I ever give, I think, I'm oh. never gonna have enough to fill the time. And then every talk I give, I think, oh my God, no, now I've got too much and I'm gonna run over. <laughs> um, um, but we've got some time for questions. I would be uh, more than happy to uh, do my best to answer. Do you wanna stop sharing your screen and come back? There, there you are. Um, it's in one question for me, or now this cap, the Pygathian cap, I'm not saying it correctly, is worn by the symbol for France, Mariana. Look yes, yeah. The Phrygian cap does become the symbol of France way later on, not in the Middle Ages. Um, I, it baffles me. I don't know when this happened. Um, but yeah, you'll even see it on the rooster, which is another like 19th century symbol of France. So you'll see a rooster wearing that same hat. Wild. Um, I don't know why the French eventually adopt the Phrygian cap as an emblem. I should look that up at some point. Yeah, it'd be interesting to know because that's how it's most commonly seen now. Yeah, this is true. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, um, you know, it hasn't like been actually worn by any peoples anywhere in the world for a couple thousand years, I think, but um, except for people, you know, attempting to wear it like in displays of French patriotism. Um, but yeah, that's a kind of late readoption of it. Yeah, it's not a, not a thing native to France. It's this thing borrowed in, definitely. Before you go, tell us what you're yeah. working on. Oh, uh, sure. Um, well, the uh, the thing I am biting my nails to the quick waiting to hear back on is I've spent literally the last 12 years writing a book um, on um, shock of shocks, medieval anti-Semitism, a topic I actively avoided for like the first 15 years that I was doing this stuff and then decided I'd finally deal with and deals with anti-Semitism in maps in particular. Um, and that's how I got into this kind of images, imagery as well from the uh, from the bestiary. So, hey, I was supposed to hear like last month and then I was supposed to hear last week. And then, so any day now, I may find out if that book is being published. Um, but um, when I'm done with that one, my next big thing uh, that I'm working on is a book that I had set aside several years ago um, on the Frank's casket, which is this extraordinary ivory box, uh, whalebone, whalebone ivory. Um, in the British Museum that has um, English runes, Latin characters, Old English, Latin language, um, scenes from Norse, Germanic, uh, Roman, Jewish and Christian myth, and a riddle and a code, and is the size of like a cigar box. Um, so I think it's the most densely packed object from the whole Middle Ages. Um, and my dear old friends, Susan Kim and I are, um, Going to write a book about that, which we've written a bunch of, we just haven't done much lately. Um, so those are the, the the things I'm actively working on these days. Uh, Virginia, I don't have specifically a question, but except that I say, what questions do you have on the topic that you just um, delivered? Since we're all in a stupor, maybe you can help <laughs> us out here. 
have wondered in particular how the manticore of all things, like why, why these images? So the hedgehog, that's, it's just this lovely little story about a cute little animal, right? But there are also, you know, big terrifying animals that also don't seem to bear this kind of extra layer of racist content. So like the dragon does not seem to refer to Jews or Muslims in any of the texts that I've looked at or the images. Um, you know, so there's all kinds of creatures in there. Uh, griffins don't seem to either. You know, so I am curious. I don't know why. Um, here, let me let me show you the griffin because it's really great. That's the thing that we had. Um, this is the page that we had in our um, Morgan exhibition was open to this. These are great wild boars, which are really gorgeous. And there's a griffin stealing uh, another boar. Um, so, you know, why why these creatures out of all of them? This is the Bonacon, um, which I borrowed from my title because they're really ridiculous and silly. I don't know if any of you have come across them before, um, but they're these big horned um, wild animals that spew fiery dung at people and can kill them with it. Um, but those also don't seem to get uh, that treatment. So, so I don't know why they focused those energies on these particular creatures. I, I would argue there's nothing natural about these associations. It's, you know, uh, uh, arbitrary, but then why? So that's my main question I have. Hmm. So we'll let you know when we figure it out. <laughs> oh, please do, by all means. All right. <laughs> Linda. Yes, Asa, thank you so much. Um, I'm curious, I mean, the bestiaries were made for, you know, literate, educated mm -hmm. people, I presume. Um, how do you think this imagery, the stereotypical imagery, translated down into the general mm. population? Do you have any uh, sense of that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I don't have any images right at, you know, my fingertips here, but... Um, Images from the bestiary appear in all kinds of contexts. So, for example, they appear on um, some medieval maps, like the Hereford map that was most likely made and, for and displayed on a pilgrimage route in Hereford Cathedral. There was a big cult um, to their um, sainted, fiercely anti-Semitic bishop, uh, Thomas Cantaloupe. Um, to which the King of England brought his sick falcons so the saint could magically heal them. Um, and so anybody passing by that um, uh, uh, that map would have had an opportunity to see a number of these types of images with little texts. And we have some evidence that medieval churches had wall labels like you would expect in a museum that say, like, this is what this image is. There aren't many that survive. Uh, if I'm remembering right, we have some from Gloucester Cathedral, um, but they also had guides called uh, custodes, what we would, becomes the modern word custodian, who would have helped people understand the stuff they were looking. They were like blue badge guides, you know? Um, so the kinds of structures of support that exist for modern tourists in, say, a medieval monument, very similar structures existed for medieval tourists in those same environments. Um, we also will see bestiary animals often in the uh, archivolts, those arched uh, sculptural uh, courses of sort of decorative moldings around doors, you know, big portals um, in churches. They show up uh, in tapestries. They show up in wall paintings. Um, they are on the insides of churches and outside of churches. They show up in castle architecture. So very uh, common. They were it seems widely known. And so, yes, they would have helped bring that same content that was certain. I mean, these are really not only books, but incredibly lavish, fully painted, gold um, uh, uh, illuminated manuscripts that would have been for very wealthy patrons, of course. Um, but uh, there is a lot of evidence for these same images being distributed much more widely, appearing in a whole lot more contexts. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Uh, Alan? Uh, yes, I have a broader question. The last point you make about the images and the text regarding uh, Muslims and Jews killing Christ the unicorn, 
or um, Asians and Africans, et cetera. Uh, of course, you make, as always, a persuasive um, point about that. I'm curious as to how controversial that point is. Is this accepted mm. in your field? Is, and if so, you know, when did it become accepted? Or is this uh, breaking news? How, is this, <laughs> uh, how, how could you describe this? That's a, that is a very good question. So the, the thing that got me so uh, worked up about these, I wasn't planning to ever do anything with bestiaries. And then I went to this bestiary show, which was gorgeous and was extremely well reviewed um, and had me like chewing the walls. I was so um, alarmed by the work that it was doing, um, mm -hmm. which was to to do two very dangerous things. One was to um, simply allow viewers to kind of passively receive these messages um, from these medieval uh, texts that are filled with deeply biased um, representations, but also even in some of the labels, like the one about Jews worshiping the, you know, the, 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 the one that compares the, um, hyenas to Jews worshiping the calf. Um, quotes medieval anti-Semitic arguments, but presents them not as such, but as if they are simply facts. So like, as the medieval text tells us, hyenas are like Jews, likewise, flesh-hungry monsters. Uh, hmm? So, okay, that content needs to be addressed up front out of the gate. So what that label should have said is, this is a highly problematic anti-Semitic image. In it, it argues the pernicious notion that, sucking flesh, yeah? You can't just put that stuff out there. Um, so, you know, when we did our exhibition in New York that had some of these very same kinds of images, we had a little section on Jews and Muslims in that. You know, we worked very hard to make sure that what we were saying was, this is something that was argued about these peoples, right? Um, and I was very gratified that all the reviews of the show and so on seem to have grasped that. So how uh, revolutionary is this? Well, okay, I run a lot on bestiaries and there's very little that actually deals with this. Um, there is one really great scholar, Deborah Strickland, who is a good friend of mine, wrote a brilliant book called Demons, Saracens, and Jews Making Monsters in the Middle Ages, um, and really explores a whole lot of this in great depth and breadth. But the majority of bestiary scholarship doesn't really take it on, is not, it seems, largely interested in those questions. Um, so there is plenty of content out there for people who are looking to find this stuff out, but there's a lot of stuff because people love bestiaries. They're so fun, right? Um, so it's pretty easy to for people to just kind of shovel that stuff off to the side and be like, look, this crazy monster shoots feces at people, you know, and then the audience laughs. So, you know, um, so yeah, I, 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 this is not, you know, from whole cloth, though I haven't read people making any of the specific arguments that I'm making here. Um, but they are also connected with arguments that other folks have definitely made. All right, thank you. And your New York show was uh, spectacular. Much obliged. I had a blast. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the, to me, the most famous of all medieval texts is the Book of the Hours, which, by the way, is available in Chantilly Branch. You can go see it. Um, but I was kind of fascinated by it in that it had a lot of pictures of just ordinary peasants going about their mm -hmm. everyday life. Nothing, nothing spectacular at all. Why don't you comment on that? Um, well, so uh, Books of Hours are, yeah, absolutely fascinating texts. They're really popular in the later Middle Ages, just when these best years are popular too. Uh, they come in a little bit after the best years, um, and then they endure for a while. And they're really pared down, simplified versions of monastic prayer manuals. So monks had these things called breviaries, which are, you know, four inches thick. And then wealthy people said, well, monks, obviously, we know they're the most religious people. Nuns have the same books, of course. Um, so we should do like what they do, 
but we don't really have time to do that. So monks prayed eight, um, at, they prayed eight times a day for about an hour each time. That's a full-time job, right? Just praying. And, you know, kings and dukes and princes and queens, they don't have that much time to do that. So they got themselves like the Cliff Notes versions. And that's what a Book of Hours is. So it's a slimmed down version, lots of pretty pictures to keep the rich people happy, you know. Um, they often have images of the patron when they're custom made works uh, bespoke. So they will see themselves sitting in a room, reading the very book that they're holding while they themselves are sitting in that room, you know, that's kind of a mise on a beam thing. Um, and so, yes, yeah, some of them will have, they have a lot of monsters in them, which is why I like them, but yeah, a lot of them will have images of peasantry and so on. Now those scenes um, have a lot of rich and interesting content as well. Um, quite a long time ago now, J.J.G. Uh, G. Alexander wrote a really spectacular um, argument about them from an openly Marxist perspective, basically saying, what did it mean for the extraordinarily rich to make lots of images of peasants in their books? How much does this accord with the lived experience of those peasants? Answer, not at all. Um, and it turns out that a lot of those images of so-called daily life are actually sort of mockeries, right? There are, a lot of them are designed to highlight the sort of foolish ways of the rustic peasantry. Um, well, it's not that surprising, right? Like they basically owned, they owned the land. And when they sold and bought land, the people came with it. So they weren't exactly trading slaves, but they were acquiring people as part of their landscape. Um, and so this is a rather instrumentalized use of human beings. Um, and so, you know, the lords who are buying these books and using them, you know, they have a vested interest basically in the dehumanization of their own labor subjects. Um, and this is an argument that I say J.J.G. G. Alexander made. Oh, when did he publish that? I mean, not really 90s, I think. It was a while ago now. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of rich work to be done digging into the imagery in those manuscripts as well, I would argue. Uh, Linda. I'm sorry, one more question. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I can't quite read the, the slide of the duration of the Crusades, but a couple hundred years, right? Um, at least. Uh, yeah. Um, so, so now, uh, the, the, and I should say, this is a slide that shows the first eight Crusades. They didn't really stop. They kept going, but they got sort of sadder and sadder as they went. Um, they, you know, there were a lot of efforts to get a crusade going and a handful of people would be like, we're on crusade. And they'd start a march and they'd all die like halfway through France. Um, so this isn't the end point of the crusades per se. The first crusade, yes, starts off in uh, 1095, but they do keep going a little while after this, but with less um, efficacy, less grandeur. Okay, so my question, sort of is that um, obviously a lot of people died on crusade, but some got home mm -hmm. and what they saw relative to beasts would have probably been, you know, dramatically different than the best Jerry's. Did you see, do you see any evolution of the beasts over time or are they kind of captured early on and then they just keep going? no matter what, that they didn't really exist. Well, so one of the curiosities about the way that the Middle Ages work, that, that these kinds of text and image cycles work is they are independent from and more authoritative than lived experience. Hmm. Okay. So uh, medieval Christians argued that, you know, God made Adam and Eve in the garden, right? And because God made them with his own hands, breathed life into them himself, they were as good as people were ever going to be. And then they had sin of discovering sex. And so they produced children who were lesser than they were. And then every generation from that point forward was worse than the one before it. This is the opposite of the idea that we get as a kind of post-enlightenment culture that humanity can improve, that we can, you know, learn and grow and improve society and the individual, right? That's a very like 18th century forward way of thinking about 
uh, human progress. So they, by and large, thought of humanity as on a steady decline. Um, they also thought that we were getting smaller. St. Jerome has a whole thing about the time that he found a giant's tooth on the beach in Utica in North Africa. And, you know, it turned, you know, he, he's not surprised. He, he's holding what may actually be a mammoth tooth fossil, um, mastodon, whichever of the ones they had over there. Um, and he thinks it's a human molar because they look a lot like human molars, but they're like this big. And he says, we shouldn't be surprised because we all know that like the Bible talks about giants like, um, you know, Goliath and Og of Basham and so on. And he says, Think of how big they must have been because they were giants to the people who lived at that time. And those people would have been giants compared to us because we are, you know, such sad little diminished modern people. Um, and so older sources were more authoritative than new ones. New information could not supplant old information because old information carried with it the genius of the greater people who lived back in the lost golden age in history. Um, and this is why we will see constant laments saying back in the old days, things were a lot better. And we see these like from the very early Middle Ages straightforward, this hearkening to a golden age that frankly never really existed. But, you know, back in the old days, things were a lot better. You may have heard people make claims like that, you know, in the continued world we live in. Um, <laughs> so, um, so yeah, people could go and they could be like, look, there's, uh, um, you know, these particular animals that live in the Middle East, right? And that does not in any way serve as like what we might think of as some kind of corrective to the bestiary content, which just carries right on. And in fact, these stories are still being actively printed in zoological texts through the 17th century. Hmm. Okay. Um, there is one really great account though. Um, I'm pretty sure it's in Marco Polo. I'm pretty sure it is. Um, so he goes and he sees a rhinoceros, right? And he says, oh, my God, people, I saw a unicorn, mm. right? Mm. But he says, everything you've heard about him is a lie. They're really ugly. <laughs> and so he's got this moment where he could be like, unicorns don't exist, but there's this fascinating thing. Let's call it a, rhino a rhinoceros. Um, but he doesn't come away with that conclusion. Instead, he comes away saying, yeah, yeah, of course they're unicorns. And I saw one. It's just, they don't look like we expect them to. Hmm. Um, where is, where is the unicorny? Right, uh, that, is, that is Marco Polo. It is Polo. Thank you for yeah. confirming. Um, this question was mine. Um, whether, whether what the Viking cruise guy says it, went back then that travel broadens and improves us and you've answered it thank you <laughs> <laughs> no problem um i do have here let me see if i can pull this up yep just um thing i i've found oh, very interesting and i've never really figured out quite what to say about but um this is the hereford map my my longest my my favorite least favorite thing i suffer with um, but uh, here we see two, um, two unicorn things. One is called a monoceros, which is what the unicorns are called in the series I was just looking at, mono, one, ceros, horn. But up here, I don't know if you can see it, it's a little abraded, but it says rhinoceros, rhinoceros. So in this case, they've gone with both. All right, there are, there are rhinoceroses and there are unicorns and they're slightly different. Um, and you can see, though this looks nothing like a rhinoceros, it does have the, um, you know, rhinos have sort of like big lobey kind of toes. And maybe this is a kind of echo of that. There may be some transmission of that knowledge that accounts for that. I'm not sure. This one's got it too. And also this one has a really adorable expression on its face. Uh, the hedgehog has me thinking, did, have you found any method in the choice of real local animals to include? I mean, um, like they were kind of open to observation on some level. Well, yeah, except that hedgehogs don't roll around in grapes and vineyards right. to bring their grapes home, right? So, right. like, they do know hedgehogs. They've got hedgehogs. They surely have seen hedgehogs. I, You've probably seen hedgehogs in England. I've only seen one once. It was in the bushes at the parking lot of a Tesco. Um, <laughs> but there it was, just snuffling around in the underbrush. 
Um, but um, so they know these are local creatures, right? But they are not then actually like getting out the uh, naturalists uh, no, you know, field notebook, looking the pencil, being like, all right, this is what they actually do, right? They are transmitting older texts that are transmitting older texts that are transmitting older texts. Um, and so these texts have this greater authority than straightforward observation. Now, this seems to us like, how could that possibly be? But relying on the senses is actually an intellectual paradigm, right? It seems like an obvious one, but it's one that comes out of the Enlightenment, out of the uh, scientific revolution of the late 17th and then the 18th century, whereby philosophers made reasoned arguments that if we made careful observation using our senses, we could actually learn new things that are not contained in old texts. Um, and that was like a very controversial, I mean, this is what gets, you know, uh, uh, Galileo put under house arrest his whole life because he looked up at the night sky and figured out how things went, right? So this was a great challenge to the current existing social order. And so, yeah, it was not um, widely uh, favored. Now, there certainly were people all throughout the Middle Ages who were doing exactly that kind of observation. And one thing I should note is that the sciences and particularly medicine were really booming in um, the Islamic world, both with uh, Muslim medical work and Jewish medical work, which is why all of the kings of Europe had Jewish and Muslim doctors, uh, because they were actually using those same kinds of approaches well before Christians had adopted them. Um, and so, you know, the kings being practical about their own lives sought out what was to them at the time the best available medical knowledge. Um, now that was being done at the same time that these images were being made. So it does make one wonder, you know, at what point did say the Jewish doctor of an English king casually flip through one of these manuscripts and see, you know, somebody uh, who was intended to look like him, um, say, attached to a person eating monster. I know of no records of anybody May, I would be so excited if we found like a little Hebrew note in the margin of one of these things, you know, but to my knowledge, none survive. Mm -hmm. um, oh, well, most is lost through the mists of time. Yeah. <laughs> well, I see we've run through to 815 and so um, we should probably all log off, but um, thank you all, as always, for hosting me. Um, thanks for your uh, questions and uh, attention and all the rest, letting me jaw on as ever about wonderful medieval things. Thank you, thank you very much. Very, very interesting. Thank you, Asa. Sure thing. Oh, and thanks to uh, Marta. Um, Kingdom of Heaven, maybe make the list. Maybe. I got to think about it. Do, you know, I'm easy to find by email, but so if you do have great medieval films, so let me know. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Asa. See everybody yeah. in December. And remember to email me and tell me what you're going to talk about for our members night. I need to hear from you. All right. Take care. Good night. Okay. Bye-bye.